I think I'll sell it. Since Grandpa died, well, it just hasn't been the same. Grandpa and I built this plane and made it fly. Now that he's gone, it's not much fun anymore. I loved my grandfather. I was closer to him than anyone in the whole world. During those hours, we spent struggling with all those bits and pieces or just relaxing over a coffee. He would tell me how he fought in airplanes just like this one in the First World War. Grandpa was a fighter pilot. Not an ace, mind you. Not a bishop or a Collishaw or a Brown or any of those other great Canadian fighter pilots who became famous. No, he was just an ordinary guy who felt he had to do his duty when his country needed him. That's the way it was in our family. It's why my father went to war when it happened all over again in 1939. Could I sell it? Some of my most treasured memories are wrapped up in that machine. It would be like selling them too. Those perfect days. Bright, clear skies, the breeze just right. Grandpa and I taking turns flying while the other watched from the ground. In those pleasant hours, Grandpa would speak of the war, his war, the first air war. Clearly, one remembers. You know, I can still recall those first newspaper accounts of powered flight in an airplane. I was just a kid at the time and had no idea what it all meant for the future. But I don't think anyone else did either. For most, it was just a fascinating curiosity. I spend hours gazing at futuristic pictures of airplanes in flight, imagining what it would be like to actually ride in one. Then, when an air show came to town, I remember how we all headed over to see what a real airplane looked like and to watch it fly. When the war broke out in 1914, it had only been 11 years since that first powered flight by the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk. I knew the British Army had some sort of flying corps, but the chances of a Canadian getting in were just about nil. Anyway, convinced that war was coming, I had already joined the militia and they let me choose the branch I would serve in. I sure as hell didn't want to slog in the infantry with rifle and bayonet. As for the cavalry, well, horses and I have never been friends and I couldn't see myself churning up the country with an enemy under as well as in front of me. So, I first went to war as an artillery officer in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, full of patriotic feeling and ready for battle. But 
But by the time I arrived, much had changed. You see, back home we read about vast armies wheeling and striking over huge distances, enveloping movements and frontal assaults, all building to that final attack that would crush the enemy and bring early victory. Instead, stalemate. The Western Front had become an elaborate network of trenches, from the Swiss border to the English Channel. A front that would not move more than a few miles either way for the next three years. One of my strongest impressions of the battlefield was the accuracy of remote artillery fire. A well-positioned emplacement with properly trained and skilled gunners could send a rain of shells over the heads of their advancing troops right to the feet of the poor sods scrambling out of their trenches or trying to hold a line of fire. To break the stalemate, both sides turned increasingly to heavy artillery. Its destructive capacity was awesome. And it was obvious that future battles would require knocking out distant enemy guns. And that meant long-range spotting to direct our fire. Soon, word got around that they were open to requests from battle-experienced artillerymen to serve as aerial observers. I realized that this was my chance, the one I'd been dreaming of since those early days of flight when I was a kid. I put in my application and pleaded with my CO for his endorsement. came through approved. And after a period of training, I returned to the war, an observation officer in the Royal Flying Corps. A little disappointed, mind you. Oh, I was going to fly all right, but not in an airplane. To me, one of the most astonishing contrivances for use in war was the kite balloon. Tethered to the ground, it could rise to close to a mile for long-range observations. But its real work was at about 1,500 feet, where it became the eyes of the artillery. Getting it into the air was no mean feat. Part of the problem was keeping it down until prepared and ready for flight. Then came the business of fitting us into the basket, complete with maps, code books, telephones, binoculars, and parachutes, just in case. Finally, ballasting, to keep us from bobbing about like a yo-yo on a string. Then we just floated up, held by a single cable rolling off a winch. What gave the balloon its lift was hydrogen gas, so inflammable that the tiniest spark could turn the whole thing into a roaring inferno.
our telephones were connected into the ground communication system, and we could make reports of enemy activity right through to brigade headquarters. But as I said, our main job was artillery spotting. First, I would give the map reference for the given target so that the guns could be set. Then after each shot, I would note the burst and give the necessary corrections. 10 degrees right, 100 yards forward, 3 degrees left, 30 yards back, and so on. Until we had the target bracketed. Often it became a race between our getting on target and his pulling it out of the way. Of course, all along the line, he would be doing the same thing to us. We would usually stay up for, say, three hours, never more than five. In a way, it seemed very strange. Here I was, an army officer, serving in an air corps, but it felt more like the Navy. A moving platform buffeted by wind and weather, occasionally seasick, and always the fear of sinking. Hydrogen was shipped in cylinders. It was used both to top up our operational balloons and to fill new ones on arrival. I had been with the section for, oh, a few months, when there came a day I will never forget. For some days, we had been having trouble with an enemy battery that, for one reason or another, had been very difficult to locate. Suddenly, word came down from Brigade that they had in place and gave us the map reference. It was too far down the line for us to handle, so the CO said he would have to move the balloon. But Brigade said no, they would send an airplane. Within an hour, we heard it coming accompanied by black bursts of anti-aircraft fire. I watched as he flew right over enemy lines and began calling shots in Morse on the wireless. Soon it was over, and the airplane flew off, no doubt to do it all over again, somewhere down the line. The brigade had received orders to move out, part of a tactical redeployment. I was sorry to see them go. Often I used to visit the gunners, to get to know personally the men I was spotting for.
Later that day, I went aloft for what I expected to be routine reconnaissance. Maybe it was the airplane earlier that day, or possibly the artillery movements, or even just chance. But somehow, we had drawn the attention of enemy aircraft. It would be most unusual for an airplane to make a straight-on attack. For one thing, he has to work out how to get close enough to do the damage, yet get safely away from the flaming debris. Then there's anti-aircraft, or Archie as we called it. I had of course given the order to winch down the moment we sighted the airplane, and told my second observer to jump when he felt like it. For myself, I was going to hold out till the last minute because, to tell the truth, I was scared as hell of jumping, and there was always a good chance that Archie would drive him off to a more likely target. In those few seconds, right after the balloon is hit, the airplane is still vulnerable. I came out of it all right, except for a few bruises and a twisted ankle. After the artillery redeployment, activity was low, and we often went up singly for routine observations. Day after day, with little to report, my thoughts kept returning to those airplanes. They had become far more valuable than anyone had foreseen, and the more I thought about it, the more desperate I became to get off that balloon and into the cockpit of an airplane. It would be my second transfer request, and I wasn't at all sure how it would be received. But as it turned out, approval came through surprisingly quickly. Later, I found out why. The casualty rate in airplanes was growing, and trained observers were in short supply. But even had I known, it wouldn't have changed anything. Like most youngsters then, I never thought about the danger of flying, only the excitement. No, my only concern was how I would fit in with the members of my squadron, many of whom had been in from the start. Hell, I had never even flown in an airplane. But a fellow Canadian they called Charlie took me aside to show me the ropes and tell me what I needed to know. I was amazed at his description of how he learned to fly. All very casual, he told me. The instructor used his own methods and moved at his own pace. As Charlie put it, the way I taught my mother how to drive a car. He 
caught on quick. After a few hours of trundling around the airfield and some indifferent landings and takeoffs, they let him go up alone. If I could get it down in one piece, Charlie said, I'd soon have my wings. said was that he could get the damn thing up and down again. Real training began in the squadron. Charlie also pointed out something I never realized. There were no fixed aerodromes. Any grassy field would do. And ground support had to follow around to wherever they chose to settle. By the time I joined the squadron, the airplane was no longer in question. Attitudes had changed, and both sides were coming up with new designs that could best exploit its many uses. Artillery spotting was only one of them. Its main job was aerial reconnaissance. In any situation, you want to know as much about the enemy as you can. Where he is, at what strength, in what formations. Gather enough such intelligence, and you can often figure out what he's up to. Traditionally, this was the job of the cavalry. But the airplane and captive balloon had taken over most of its reconnaissance role. Many cavalry units dismounted to serve alongside the infantry in the trenches. Others waited in vain for that break in the enemy lines that would rekindle the excitement of a cavalry charge. Throughout the war, the process was pretty much the same. Aerial observers returned from long-range strategic patrol, or local tactical patrol, with carefully mapped descriptions of enemy movements and changes in enemy positions. Day after day, patrol after patrol, this information went through to brigade, and then on to army headquarters where the reports from all the brigades would be compared, interpreted, and evaluated, all winding up in the daily situation report, a detailed analysis of what was happening along the entire front. As the war progressed and equipment became available, they made greater use of aerial photography. By the end of the war, it was estimated that our airplanes provided over six million photographs with a capacity for military detail that was astonishing. For one offensive alone, over 88,000 separate negatives were used to plan the operation. Behind the aviators stood the ground crews. After each patrol, the machines got an immediate and complete going over. Mechanics checked the still warm engines and did the necessary servicing. The riggers and fitters, it seemed, could do anything, from patching a bullet hole to rebuilding a downed machine, working with wood, wire, and fabric, using the ordinary tools of a skilled craftsman.
armorers maintain the guns. Each magazine carefully loaded round by round. Each gun checked for mechanical malfunction, both before and after flight. You see, our war was a fight for information. I have heard it argued that the airplane was one of the causes of our static war. The element of surprise, so essential for offensive operations, had been lost. Both sides had no choice but to dig in. Our incessant aerial patrols with map and camera ensured that they would stay there. Our machine was the BE-2C. Designed for maximum stability, they served as slow-moving aerial observation platforms. Trouble was, in achieving this, they sacrificed maneuverability, which made us sitting ducks for any attacker. If attacked, it was my job to man the gun while Charlie used evasive tactics to cut and run. But the enemy didn't have all that much to attack with. In fact, early in the war, nobody even expected airplanes to actually fight. When two aviators from opposing sides met in the air, they would often wave at each other in a spirit of aerial camaraderie. But not all airmen felt that way. The enemy was the enemy, in the air or on the ground. They first tried to get on top of the enemy machine and drop a grenade, but the slipstream carried it away. Eventually, they took to carrying small arms, and it's an historical fact that the first air battles were opposing airmen blasting away at each other with pistol and rifle. What was needed, of course, was an attack plane. Fast, high rate of climb, maneuverable. But where to put the armament? At first, a machine gun was mounted firing at an angle to avoid the propeller. But this made it difficult to aim. The French attempted to improve on this by placing metal deflectors on the propeller blades and firing straight through. Even if this reduced the life of the machine, it could be worth it. But the Germans, having caught on to what the French were doing, went back to an older, more sophisticated idea. Synchronized gun and propeller so that the gun wouldn't fire when a blade is in front. They gave the design problem to the Dutch engineer, Anthony Fokker. He quickly developed a synchronizing gear for the gun-propeller combination and installed it on one of his early monoplanes, later called the E-1 or Eindecker. Test flight showed that it worked, and worked well. A new air weapon, the world's first single-seat fighter, firing forward in the pilot's line of sight, where man and machine became as one.
From high in the sky and out of the sun, they swoop down on the helpless bees. From the distance, they appeared as tiny insects, but when they closed, they revealed their deadly sting. The Germans, of course, were elated. Given time with their superior weapon, they would drive those pesky reconnaissance planes from the skies. On our side, morale sank. They had a name for us, Fokker Fokker. And those who died had suffered the Fokker scourge. But the German euphoria and our despair were not to last. British designers already had in production the answer to the forward firing Fokker, the FE2, or FI, as we came to call it. They achieved the same advantage by simply placing the propeller in back and have it push the plane and putting a gunner right out in front with a wide angle of fire with yet a second gun for firing over the wing. Also a bit of luck. A Fokker pilot lost his way and had landed by mistake at one of our airfields. This gave us a chance to do comparative flying tests. It turned out the Fokker wasn't all that good. No question, the V could match it, even outperform it, as soon as it could be brought into service in sufficient numbers. You see, what defeated us was not so much the superior weapon, but the legend of its invincibility. We felt demoralized because we thought the Germans had achieved the perfect air weapon and we might never be able to match it. But when our new machines took to the air, our spirits rose with them. And the seemingly invulnerable Fokker passed quietly into history. And oh yes, we soon developed our own synchronizing gear used by Sopwith in his one-and-a-half strutter. During the Fokker scourge, and maybe as a result, we had a change in leadership. Boom Trenchard took over as our general officer commanding. His creed was offense, and he swore by it. He had observed the use of aircraft at the Battle of Verdun, and had become convinced that using fighters to defend core planes was bad strategy. Their proper role was to take the offensive, to engage other fighters before they reach the battle area. He formed new squadrons, consisting exclusively of fighter airplanes. During battle, these would be sent forth at squadron strength to seek out and destroy the enemy deep in his own territory. Core planes, like our BEs, would also form separate squadrons and be expected to work even more closely with ground forces. You remember I said how you need to know what the enemy is up to? Well, in battle, it's just as important to find out how your own forces are doing. For this, you need fast, accurate communications using every means at hand. And that's where we came in. They called it contact patrol, which meant gathering the information and somehow getting it to where it was needed.
they kept us practicing for months. For there was a major offensive in the Opi that was to get us out of the trenches and into the open and end this war of attrition. So while the troops concentrated on their battle exercises, we had to sort out all that rigmarole about getting messages back and forth to the ground. They had an elaborate system of ground signals involving strips of white cloth and klaxon horns. I'd completely forgotten the details. We all called it kindergarten. We'd act out orders from the field commanders like reconnoiter and report on enemy battery positions in vicinity Archambault Farm with the map reference. Or we'd simply deliver messages. Second Infantry Brigade reached first objective. Advance on second objective. We'll commence at 11.25 hours. Of course we did our usual reconnaissance and artillery spotting, but we knew that come the battle, contact with the ground would be a much more makeshift affair than all that stuff the planners had come up with. Anyway, as the weeks went on, exercises intensified, and every means of communication was brought into play. Finally, it came. Later, it would be called the Battle of the Somme. And no, it didn't work out the way the generals planned it either.
The Battle of the Somme ended in the mud of November. The front had moved a mere 13 miles to the east, but at a cost of 420,000 British, 200,000 French, and 450,000 Germans, over a million men. had worked. In our core planes, we were surgically isolated from the carnage below. And as the men on the ground wrote angry letters and bitter poems, we who had lived through the Fokker scourge to become triumphant in the air could only feel the surge of victory. But the trenchard policy of putting all fighters on strategic offense leaving core planes undefended had a potentially fatal flaw. It depended on superior numbers of high-performance airplanes. This put an enormous burden on both designers and manufacturers, both to improve performance and maintain a steady flow of finished battle-ready machines. also required an equally reliable flow of qualified aviators, which the training establishments would have to provide. But the Germans were not sitting idle, waiting for a break in British production. They too had developed a new and different strategy, specifically designed to overcome the numerical advantage of the Allies. They began by selecting highly motivated, well-trained, and the best skilled aviators. Then formed them into elite justice, roughly the equivalent of squadrons, 
each under the command of a leader chosen for his ability to combine daring with discipline. One of these was the soon-to-be-famous Baron von Richthofen, who already had demonstrated his prowess in one-on-one -on -one combat. But most important, they set up a warning system with telescopic devices to detect distant enemy machines. Using landlines, field watchers relayed their information back to the airfield, reporting numbers, height, and direction. The effect of this strategy was soon apparent. When Allied machines approached the battle area, they soon faced a superior force of enemy fighters, already in the air and ready to engage. Tactics had all been worked out in advance by the most experienced aviators. First, protect each other. Then, if you can gain height advantage, swoop down, trading height for speed. If you miss, don't go after him. Use your speed to regain height. And if it's one-on-one -on -one with a lumbering core plane, well... Never had the odds been so uneven. By now, the FEs and DHs were hopelessly outclassed by the Fockers and Albatrosses. New pilots with only a few hours solo had to go up against the seasoned German Jaspers. That they were determined and courageous only made them get killed faster. <laughs> New designs were still on the factory floor. Better training methods were still being tested. Meanwhile, April 1917 saw the death rate in the air reach an all-time high. It became forever known as Bloody April. Our by now antiquated DEs were the easiest targets of all. But there was no let up on patrols. The work had to be done no matter what the odds. It was the whole purpose of the air war. You see, unlike the stalemate on the ground, the air advantage kept moving back and forth from one side to the other, and the battle for air superiority could be won or lost in the designer's workshop or on the production floor. Both sides worked feverishly to come up with designs that would improve aerodynamic efficiency, greater lift, less drag, to achieve faster speeds and higher rates of climb. Decisive factors in many an air battle. Just as intense was the effort to improve engine performance. New designs emerged for both inline engines, the type used in automobiles, and rotaries, designed specifically for airplanes. The fundamental design problem was the same for both. What's needed is a better power to weight ratio. I guess it can be said that our war took aeronautical science out of its infancy 
and created a whole new class of scientists and engineers dedicated to the development of the airplane. Trouble was, it was all so new and the need for finished machines so great that often whole new designs went right through to production only to be superseded and discarded. But one that made it was the Fokker triplane, itself inspired by the Sopwith version of the same configuration. And that's the one that got us. He came out of the clouds, ready for the kill. He only needed one burst. Charlie was hit, but somehow he got us down. When the machine tipped and rolled over, I blacked out. They rushed Charlie to a hospital where they did everything they could, I'm sure. But in the end, Charlie was dead. In the field hospital, I got to thinking, Charlie and I were not just friends. We were a team, and a damn good one. But the team was broken, and I just couldn't see myself in the second seat without Charlie at the controls. Even as they shipped me back to England, I was determined to return, but as a pilot, and God in the RFC willing, a fighter pilot. I was now part of the walking wounded, with months of recovery ahead of me. I was soon struck by the number of Canadian flyers and was surprised to learn how things had changed back home. At the beginning, Canada had no plans to support an air war. Its contribution would be the Canadian Expeditionary Force. As the severity of the air war increased, policy changed. Ottawa agreed that the RFC could recruit and train in Canada and that the Canadian government would provide all possible support. The new organization was referred to simply as RFC Canada and put under the command of Cuthbert C. Hoare. To help with the manpower problem, Hoare cast an inquisitive eye across the U.S. border. With the friendly connivance of senior American officials, he opened a recruiting office on Fifth Avenue in New York, ostensibly for the purpose of recruiting British subjects domiciled in the United States. But soon, half his intake was American, and the State Department put a stop to it. Yet, the record shows that many Americans went to the air war in France via Canada. Whenever I look back on those turbulent years, I often reflect on the surprising performance of Canadian aviators. I think it had more to do with attitude than anything else. It's hard to explain. In England, in all of Europe for that matter, war was fought by the book with clearly defined lines of authority that tended to parallel class structures. In the air war, the book had yet to be written. Anyway, it soon became apparent that Canadians had a strong tendency to question, challenge, improvise, and simplify, with less reliance on the command structure to tell them how to do their jobs. And Canadian airmen went on to do a remarkable job, way out of proportion to their numbers which really pleased the folks back home. We're from Canada, we're from Canada, the land we uncompared. Where the sun shines bright and the stars run bright, look down on our great long hair. From 
built an airfield and established a flying school. Orr was amazed. 57 buildings went up in only four months, complete with roads, sewage facilities, rail sidings, and grass grown from seed. He reported that work appears to be put through here at a speed which is unknown in England. Despite the speed, everything was built to last, and the Borden experience became a model for future RFC training in other parts of the world. For a training plane, they turned to the Curtis Company and acquired rights to build a modified version of their famous Jenny. The Canadian government provided the financing to purchase the Curtis plant in Toronto and renamed it Canadian Aeroplanes Limited. It soon began turning out in quantity the JN4D, later dubbed the Canuck, for use at Borden and other Canadian training fields. Meanwhile, recruiting continued for all parts of the service, which now included RFC Canada. A lot was being asked of the finest young men of a very young country. For me, in England, it was off to the ground training school at Oxford. The course was mostly theoretical, with lots of demonstrations in those awful training films that showed you everything from how to build an airplane, to how a camera works. I don't think I would have felt like that if I were a new entry. All useful stuff, really. But I had months of air patrol and combat and had done much of what they taught, so it was all a bit tedious. It was also pure army, complete with parades, inspections, and a healthy dose of the code of military discipline. That was a little hard to take. But then it was on to flying school, where finally I would learn to fly. Training methods had changed radically since Charlie's day. Instead of the see what I do and try to do likewise approach on the old MFs, they had a training syllabus that really worked. First remove the mystique of flying. They did this by explaining how aerodynamic forces work on the control surfaces of the airplane. What they wanted to dispel was the notion that flight was some precarious balance in an unnatural environment. Just the opposite. The airplane is always controlled by natural forces following the laws of nature. Understand those laws and learn how to control the forces and you can make the airplane do anything it's capable of and avoid what it's not. Our airplane was the Avro 504. It had all the right characteristics for a training plane. A two-seater that handled like a single-seat fighter and capable of performing all the maneuvers we needed to learn and practice. 
Also, it had a heavy rotary engine that imparted strong gyroscopic forces while maneuvering, dangerous if not anticipated. Frontline airplanes were now so equipped. Then came dual instruction in the airplane. We had dual controls, unheard of in earlier days, and communicated through a speaking tube, another innovation. Each day I concentrated on a new bit of flying. Stall, spins, loops, dives, until I felt confident I had full control of the airplane in any situation. As part of the new training program, the restrictions were relaxed on aerobatics. Previously, it was called stunt flying and severely limited as to where, when, and why. Now we were encouraged to do all the aerobatics we could to discover the full limits of our machines and ourselves. As our crosswind landings, they sent us to an airfield near the sea. There we ran into flyers from the Royal Naval Air Service who told us some of their experiences handling airplanes on ships.
Finally, our squadron assignments. For me, it was back to the Western Front, right in the thick of it. A fighter squadron of SE-5As. To get me there, they first gave me a camel to fly to Saint-Omer, the big operational supply and field command headquarters in northern France. Immediately on landing, I walked over to movement section to see about getting to my aerodrome. I knew I could go part of the way by rail, but for the rest, I would have to use army transport. While waiting for my papers, I had a chance to find out just how things were going. The technical gap had been closed. With our new bristles, SEs, and the marvelously spirited camels. The French had their latest Newports and Spads. And now the Americans were over here, flying the best of the French airplanes. The Germans had the latest Falses and Albatrosses. And the new Fokker D7s, they were good. But overall, it was an even match, except we had the numbers. Finally, large quantities of good airplanes and well-trained airmen were reaching the front. The tide had turned, and I was part of it. It's jolly good luck, jolly conduct, and all the Allied soldiers they're fighting day by day. His friends are far away. They'll all march back with the Union Jack in history they'll get paid. Eventually, I reached my squadron. This time, I fitted in quickly and easily with the members of my squadron. Even though I was new, still, I had flown many more hours and been through more aerial combat than most of them. For the first few days, I only flew short, safe patrols to get the feel of my SE. The CO soon discovered that I wasn't that great a shot, so he sent me off to the gunnery range to get my eye in and to practice my deflection shooting. Of course, because there was no actual flying, there were no ground crews, so we did our own maintenance. In fact, I enjoyed it. A strong feeling of fellowship grew among us not-so-hot gunners.
Then, my first aerial combat. We received a report of enemy reconnaissance planes working our lines with orders to locate them and bring them down. Eventually, I spotted one. My deflection shooting was still not up to par, not enough combat experience. So rather than swoop down with guns blazing, I decided on a stalking tactic, often used by both sides. I got on his tail, right in the blind spot of the observer's guns. I stayed with him until I felt the chance for a clear shot, under and up. But I fired too soon. Buck fever. I knew those German two-seaters had tough and experienced crews, and it had been drilled into us that if you can't surprise one, don't go circling after him. He can shoot across the circle. I also went after enemy balloons. Didn't like that much. Having served on them myself, I had a special feeling for those men. But my real job, I knew, was to engage other fighters. Our strategic course remained the same. Come hell or high water, take the offensive, seek out the enemy, destroy him on his own territory. And come hell or the Americans, the Germans stuck to their defensive strategy. They reformed their jastas into even larger fighter wings, self-contained, ready to move on short notice to any part of the front where needed. In this way, they could overcome the disadvantage in total numbers and still achieve local air superiority. Because they kept appearing and reappearing at various parts of the line, they came to be known as flying circuses. Morale was high on both sides, each confident of its flying skills and fighting spirit. And so the stage was set for the great air battles of the war. Each morning at dawn, the ground crews wheeled out the machines for first patrol. As they prepare the machines, I must prepare myself, body and mind, for the ordeal ahead. The SE can reach heights of 20,000 feet at speeds of over 100 miles an hour. At those speeds, in temperatures of 20 below zero, exposed flesh can freeze in a matter of seconds, and the lack of oxygen induces a feeling of giddiness that threatens concentration. I'm not hungry, but I must eat, and carefully. Gas in the stomach can cause projectile vomiting, in the intestine, excruciating pain. Easy on the teeth. In high-speed maneuvers, G-forces press on the bladder. Urinating into your clothing results in frostbite. We head for the CO's briefing. Many delay flying gear until the last minute to avoid sweat getting into their underclothing. Briefing usually consisted of little more than what I have heard or what the latest reports lead us to expect. It didn't matter. Once you were up, you could expect anything. Then to the machines, each man going through his own good luck ritual. 
everyone knew what no one would say. Fighters, designed and built for the sole purpose of destroying other fighters, sought each other in the sky to lock in combat, to test the limits of both man and machine. We now flew formation, covering our blind spots, scanning the skies for that all-important first sighting that would allow for surprise and getting in the first blow. I'd been flying regular patrols for some time now, and as a grizzled old hand, I'd earned some regard, so they made me a flight commander, and I flew the two streamers on my machine, which indicated that others must form on me. Maybe it was because of that, or more likely it would have happened anyway. I began to feel a new kind of fear. Not the gut-wrenching fright that occurs in any battle, or even the nervous anticipation of danger that is part of every patrol. No, this was something different and most unsettling. I became convinced I would never get out of this thing alive. And not without reason. I began to realize that those enemy bullets won't always miss their target. Archie bursts won't always remain off to one side. Evasive maneuvering won't always shake off the attacker. And I had the evidence before my eyes. Direct hits on my machine. Empty seats in the mess. I considered the odds and decided they were infinite against me. Of course, I did beat the odds, but only because of the armistice. In the deadly war of attrition, the Germans had thrown in their last reserves. After the war, I got to thinking about what it all meant. All that slaughter of fine men on both sides, I guess I'll never understand. But in the air, something changed. Seems strange now, but when I transferred to the Royal Flying Corps, I lost my identity as a Canadian. I became just another colonial, serving the cause of king and empire. Maybe that's why I was so anxious about fitting in. But you know, as the war went on, we surprised a lot of them. We Canadians did more in the air than anyone ever expected of us, even ourselves. When it finally ended, Canada had sent over 10,000 airmen, about a third of all British aviators. Even more astonishing was our success. Of the top three British aces, two were Canadian. Billy Bishop, 
Only one victory from the top in the Royal Flying Corps and winner of the Victoria Cross. And Ray Collishaw, the highest scoring ace in the Royal Naval Air Service. We had shown that we could hold our own with the best of them. That's why we wanted our own air service, like the Canadian Army with its expeditionary force. We felt we had earned it. It was too late for this war, of course, but later they created the Royal Canadian Air Force. And with that, I believe our country grew a little. No, I won't sell it. It just doesn't seem right. I can't explain it. I just want to keep the memory alive of Grandpa and all the others. For me, there is no official record, only the remembrance of things past in a distant land where they were all aces.